Thank you. So, well, thank you again for having me here in Hamburg at uh, TUHH. And uh, it's great to be here for this workshop and trying to make this connection with also uh, Mario's presentation. I think here relationship and uh, brain enhancement, which you will look in, you will see in a second, is biotechnology. So, in which way our uh, advancements in studying how the brain works could help our relationships? You referred earlier to this uh, famous study in Israel concerning the level of serotonin and our judgment. And what I want to do in this talk is to explore. Uh, more specifically, uh, a type of the various kind of relationship that we can have, namely that of love, which tends to be a rather um, sensitive topic, <laughs> and to an extent not so uh, normally linked to technology. And yet, um, I, I will be specifying this in a second. There are many different ways of love, many types of love. We will be focusing on romantic love in this particular instance. Yeah, this is, you know, one of my loves, personally. Uh, that's a football player, by the way. But, uh, so, of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, to define love. I mean, the poems have been written, songs, and even trying to be as scientific as possible, definitions could vary. So the one that I will be using that refers to Fisher first and secondly to Herb, Sandberg and Sabulescu among others, is that that combines three uh, definitions. So attachment, attraction and lust. These three combined uh, variables are uh, what we can define as love in, in this talk. So as we were saying earlier, and as studies are uh, constantly showing, substances such as dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and their levels in our brains seem to be strongly associated with our love relationships. And of course, ignoring this would be scientifically uh, unwise. Uh, and of course, these very recent studies have shown that although our emotions are not only chemical reactions, our high order conceptualization of love responds to and is shaped by also by the presence or absence of these substances. So for example, this, um, this study has shown that the administration of oxytocin can induce Pair bonding involves that we're not engaged in mating behavior prior to the injection of the substance directly in the brain. On the other hand, when given oxytocin blockers, animals that were first inclined towards monogamous relationships discarded their old mates and so sought new sexual partners. Now, to my knowledge, up until now, we have not had such a, an invasive study on humans, namely no one has injected anyone else with oxytocin directly in the brain, but we do have, this I've taken from the internet, we do have these sprays, I, I've not tried them, I don't know if they work or not, but supposedly they should, somehow. Synthetic, synthetic oxytocin has been uh, uh, gradually uh, used and prescribed even by uh, couple therapies as an enhancer, if you like, as a helper uh, to um, strengthen or re-strengthen. This is more in case of lost love, if you like. So of couples that for some reason have lost, have lost their uh, connection, they try this help. And of course, the argument there is, uh, um, is that if we allow some educational enhancement or uh, some other forms, namely that of using a psychologist uh, to help your couple, why shouldn't we do so through uh, biochemical substances? So, of course, there is a tempting side to it because we could try to, to define love drugs as 
some love preserving drugs like the one that I've just shown you, or love diminishing drugs, so useful to herb to help a person detaching herself from an abusive partner. And this is an example that has been used in the literature. Well, of course, it's powerful. If you have someone that, and there are uh, people that are stuck in a, an a healthy, unhealthy relationship, and you could have this pill to allow her or him uh, to abandon once and for all a partner, there could be some temptation to, to use that. Uh, but I think that it's, it's not as simple. And of course, my ultimate aim is to raise just more questions, not really give you answers, as Mario was you know, saying earlier. That's the key. So the argument that has been used is, is that love drugs uh, can be a way of uh, enhancing our freedom. So we, we know what is our ultimate goal, say in this case, in an unhealthy relationship, what I really want to do is to say goodbye to this partner that is treating me unfairly, maybe even violently. So I freely choose to take this pill that will allow me to find the strength and change the brain composition so to uh, fulfill my ultimate desire. And that sounds fine. And as I said, even... Uh, uh, acceptable, morally speaking. But uh, first of all, one has to take into consideration the fact that uh, there are many ways of uh, having to deal with, uh, with love in, uh, in a non-ideal uh, sense. So for example, lost love, if you, you know, one dear one uh, dies, uh, rejection and so on. So it, it is also part of our life as it is anything that makes us suffer. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to go as far as Nietzsche's, but I could, you know, wh whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that could well apply for love as well. And it could. I mean, think of all the instances in which after having been rejected or whatever it is, you eventually find your true love. That would not have been possible if you would have undergone this bio biochemical treatment uh, prior to the final fantastic relationship that you're living now. And um, again, this is the argument that has been used, is that if we are using uh, uh, counseling for heartbroken situations, why shouldn't be using technology or biotechnology for them too? Uh, but how far should we go? to prevent ourselves from living and experiencing these negative uh, situations. Um, again, not, not only we shape our identity, but um, we need to, to cope with it, accepting the fact that it's part of life. And the risk of not doing that is to enter this fear of medicalization, of starting to think that we are sick because we are in love that we need to cure our uh, sphere of love relationships because we are in an unhealthy status. And I, uh, I have no idea, how long did I start? Okay, so how long do I have? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, the idea is that gradually our society has uh, medicalized more and more areas of our everyday life. And I think that it, it could be extremely risky to allow uh, relationships uh, or emotional relationships and specifically love to also be medicalized. In, in other words, using current definition, which is medicalization describes a process by which non-medical problems become defined and treated as medical problems, usually in terms of illnesses or disorders. So I think, yes, you, you're absolutely allowed to be heartbroken, but to start conceptualizing that we need to cure ourselves from it, it's, it's worrying. Uh, the authors uh, that I referred to in the very beginning, of course, being uh, smart people, 
they are aware of this uh, uh, critique and they say that medicalization per se is neither good or bad and we should not be misguided uh, by the use of this term and by the fact that we could medicalize as long as it works, basically. All right, that's scary. <laughs> it doesn't feel loved. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, in, in a discussion uh, related to this, to this topic, uh, Alberto Giubilini uh, right, that uh, this is what makes the medicalization of love different from other forms on, of enhancement. The, me the medicalization of love is about medicalizing a whole aspect of human biology almost ex novo. And although we disagree on many issues, um, I, I agree with him uh, in this instance. And yes, enhancing love is very different from other forms of enhancement. And just to clarify, because sorry, I should have probably pointed out, I somehow assume that you are vaguely familiar, at least, uh, with the, the human enhancement uh, debate, but maybe you are not. So I will uh, quickly point out that by human enhancement, um, human enhancement is, uh, is an ideology that uh, wants to um, embrace technology, biotechnology, of course there are different degrees, and use them to make ourselves better, better human beings, uh, rather than just uh, limiting ourselves to, to restore through therapy what is the normal level of a certain function, the idea there is to, to go beyond. In other words, if, if I could be able to, as, as actually you can, if I could, by doing an operation in my eyes, not be able to use this therapeutic tool, namely the glasses, to see better, the argument there is why not trying to have the high sight of a hawk, given that you're doing you know, a similar... Uh, I don't think that is possible, actually, but you know, for the sake of argument. So that's the idea. And, and of course, you can apply that to many different contexts, not last relationships, and that's where... So that's why I was saying enhancing one's eyesight is one thing, uh, strength, cognitive capacities even, if you like. We were saying earlier, coffee, it's, uh, it's a cognitive enhancer, although it's extremely accepted by our society at least, which is another discussion altogether. So to try and uh, raise perhaps some uh, themes for discussion, uh, aside from the general uh, critic that can be moved against human enhancement. For example, Rob Sparrow points out how boring the world could be if we just keep on enhancing ourselves. Uh, and, you know, it could be a way, you know, the, a perfect world in, in, in where everyone is perfect, it might be rather boring. Uh, and that could well apply also for relationships. I mean, uh, if not most of all. Uh, and then there are a number of... Um, of themes that I have defined as theological disenhancement, unloved soldiers, useless inauthentic love, conversion therapy, and discrimination. Uh, let's see how we do with time, and then uh, we'll move forward. Okay, so just to start with a light topic, cases of pedophilia. <laughs> um, so cases of pedophilia and child sexual abuse within regional schools are widely, sadly, are widely known across the globe, across different uh, faiths. Uh, and of course, uh, the opportunity to chemically ensure a sexual neutrality um, of the religious representatives um, could function as a way of regaining trust from the communities. In other words, if you know, if I'm a parent and I'm choosing to send my school, uh, my child, my children to a religious school, I might be more inclined if I'm ensured by this chemical blocker that person X will be sexually uh, neutrally charged, if you can say that. But there are some issues, of course, even theological, if you like. So one of the ideas is if I send my child to, say, a Catholic school, uh, the idea is that theologically I would 
imagine that the priest in charge has a vocation of some sort, you know, this call that will put him, most of the time, if not a nun, um, in a condition to be teaching children. So to be in a situation where uh, I need to ensure my myself through science of something that has to do with faith is, is a bit strange to say. Can I ask a question? Sure. So when you say, uh, can you go back? So sure. Sexual neutrality, you mean something like a form of a you know, chemical castration? Or something? something along those lines. Not, not as bad, but something that would really uh, reduce, which, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's doable. That is, it's possible to reduce the libido. Uh, but but every, I think that the problem there is, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's substantial, it's theological, because then what, what would be the effort of the priest in this case, for example? Uh, it's complicated. I think it's not, it's not, it's not so easy. Um, yeah, so, uh, and of course, uh, so say, for example, that we stick to this idea that is... Um, um, a Catholic school, then what could happen would be, could be that even people that are not religious or that are not Catholic, but knowing that that Catholic school is using uh, chemical blockers that ensure ensures non uh, cases of uh, non pedophilia, then they might be tempted to sign up their children in, in that school and uh, making putting some sort of pressure in A, secular school, and B, other, uh, um, other schools that, are, that they have a different religious faith. So, of course, this is uh, uh, you know, something that we can discuss and elaborate further, but I think it's something, it's not that given, and it's, it's interesting to think of this social uh, aspect. Another one that I think it's, it's actually, out of all, it possibly is the most impellent one to, to think of, uh, simply because it's not that uh, far from reality. I mean, we do know right now the U.S. Army allows for non-citizens to gain green card access as long as they sign up to the U.S. Marines, for example. And out of that, if I'm not mistaken, and please don't quote me, but I believe that nearly half of the U.S. Marines are originally non-U.S. citizens. What does that mean? It means that basically the army is taking advantage um, of a situation of initial disadvantage. So those that want to, of course, one can question the aspect of they freely do so, uh, no one puts a gun to their heads, but... Mm, the, 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 the point is that in order to gain, to get access to the green card, they are willing to risk their lives, they are willing to sign up for the army. So, having that in mind, is it really that unthinkable to imagine that while signing up for this contract of the years, the government, not necessarily the US, it could be Italy, Germany, uh, Israel, China, Iran, whoever you want, Army X decides that, obviously, having a group of soldiers that don't have romantic engagement with anyone across the, the, the world will make them more responsive, will make them more sharp. The, imagine you, you are on the field and you just discovered that you have become a father. I would imagine I'm not a father, I'm definitely not on the field, but I would imagine that some kind of emotional... Uh, impairment, if you like, will occur. If you want to have an army as efficient as possible, it's functional to be able to remove this variable. And yet, it would put these people in a condition that um, should be analyzed at least. So it could be fair, uh, but I think that we should at least uh, um, explore this and, and uh, um, say it up front. In other words, this could, uh, could uh, be implemented because we do already uh, in many societies, if not all, we do grant soldiers uh, a supposed 
uh, respect by default. And maybe you could, uh, this could go along those lines, but um, uh, should be acknowledged more. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, the useless inauthentic love, Michael O. Keller uh, points out uh, that we could get rid of love altogether were we to find alternatives to ensure the same or higher level of individual well-being. Yeah, because let's not forget that the idea behind this law of enhancement is that you want to ensure your own well-being, your feeling better about yourself and of yourself. So we could just get rid of this definition. If, if, I would have, if I could find that balance, if you want even biochemical balance in my brain uh, on my own without the need of having a stable relationship with someone else, why, why should I do so? I mean, and that's, that's problematic because love supposedly is, well, in the mass majority of cases, when we're talking about romantic love is between two people, but even if you, know, if you want to be really open-minded, it's in any case is uh, among a number of people. So, uh, yeah, well, I don't know, five, <laughs> let's say, you know, maximum, I don't know, but. Uh, um, and this somehow is perhaps linked with the later talk. I don't know if uh, Steph will be talking about uh, sex robots. Uh, possibly not, that's good. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, something that I'm sure you have been reading in news new more and more. Uh, it has been covered uh, uh, increasingly, this possibility of having sex robots. And it kind of exemplifies this idea. The idea if, you know, as long as you are able to satisfy what you think is valuable for you and what makes you feel better, there is no need to have on the other side of the relationship someone that might um, uh, think differently or might uh, redirect your thoughts. You just have to, um, uh, you just have to ensure that you are able to uh, reach whatever goal it is. And among those uh, posthumanists that I referred to earlier, uh, they even claim that perhaps having sex with robots might be better than with a human being because it can ensure longer life and so forth, but we won't be going into that just yet. You're, you're, you're more than welcome to ask, uh, you know, later, but uh, I just, I, because I want to, uh, I want to uh, point out to you this example just to make you think. So even if we try to, uh, to imagine a positive scenario of how we could implement these uh, drugs, uh, so say, for example, there is Jim, a blue-eyed, white Englishman that rationally decides to take some love-enhancing drugs that will make him more attracted to black women because he wants to actively ensure that society becomes less racist. So, in theory, it is, you know, it's kind of nice, the message that he wants to. So, soon after he does begin this treatment, he meets Asantewa, a charming Ghanaian, and they quickly fall in love. Would he still be in love with her if he stopped taking the drugs? That's one question. And if he did, we should wonder why he needed the drugs in the first place. And if he didn't, we would have to accept the artificiality of the term love in this instance. And what about the same scenario? Would we, because this is kind of nice, the premises, but would we tolerate the same fulfillment of an individual version of what well-being might be if the, if the idea was that of a racist. So what about if Jim, a blue-eyed white Englishman, would want to use love enhancing drugs to, so to ensure that he would just feel attracted by blue-eyed uh, white English woman? That, you know, we would feel more uncomfortable towards. So. Uh, and kind of linked to that, and this idea of being able to shape our love slash sexual uh, identity, uh, conversion therapy is is uh, 
it's an issue. This is, uh, maybe we can show it this. I don't know. A three-year-old Texan who grew up in a conservative household with my mother, my father, and my sister, and I've been through seven years of conversion therapy. The very first thing my mother told me uh, when I told her that I was gay was that we were going to fix it. The very first counselors we went to, of course, were not conversion counselors. They were just regular counselors. And they told my mother and me that there was nothing wrong with being gay. So we went to more radical organizations. Each counselor progressively got worse. They would blame the fact that I have not changed on my lack of a desire in my heart to change they continue to convince my parents that I wasn't trying hard enough to change. The problem is, of course, is that no matter how hard you try to change, there's no change possible. But what, what if, there, if there is? What if, you know, through this uh, biochemical redirection of, um, uh, of our sexual preferences, we could uh, indeed uh, choose who to feel attracted to. Can you imagine the pressure that certain group of the society might have? That's, uh, that's of course, is, it's problematic because he, a person like this guy that has been unfortunate enough to, I think he said seven years, he went through this process of trying to get rid of his gayness. The moment that we would scientifically know that there, 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 there is the possibility of redirecting it, certain uh, part of our society will, will feel an enormous pressure of, uh, of adapting to the majority. And I think that's, um, that's extremely problematic. And even internally, they might even choose, well, I want to belong to my particularly conservative family, so I want to reject my natural inclinations, well, without the brackets, perhaps, natural inclinations, because I feel that I prioritize belonging to community X uh, or Y, uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's also problematic. Um, so even if not enforced by the state, there is this, uh, always this fear of some sort of eugenic, eugenic programs behind it. Because the moment that the, um, uh, the different ones uh, are somehow indirectly pushed to standardize themselves, so to uh, uh, follow the main guidelines of society, then there is the risk that no one will eventually be allowed to, uh, to be different. And, uh, and I think, I think that, uh, that's that for now. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, more than, uh, than enough, I think, as, to start the, the, the discussion. Um, I hope that's, uh, that's okay with you, and uh, I'm open for questions, discussions, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.